The world is complicated and is becoming increasingly so. We often seem to be at the whim of unpredictable or complex systems, the weather, stock markets, and uh, these days, the spread of disease. While experts claim to be able to predict outcomes, these predictions are short-term forecasts at best. This complex world has led to a study of systems, or systems thinking that helps us understand why systems behave in the way they do, and to help us create models that anticipate the kind of unpredictability that is important to our world. This is important for the law. Traditionally, law has been isolated from other ideas, and law has had to, over time, embrace new ways of thinking, things like economics and public policy. And now systems thinking is on the horizon as something that is important for law. It's something that we take quite seriously here at CQ University, particularly in the criminology courses. So let's consider the issue of sentencing. We once used simple linear models to predict the impact of sentencing. The idea was that the more severe the penalties, um, although more costly to implement, but these severe penalties would have a higher deterrent effect and would therefore reduce crime. But this just hasn't happened. In some situations, more severe penalties have sometimes led to increases in violent crime, even things like the death penalty. The existence of the death penalty can drop conviction rates. And uh, there's something that's called the grim irony of deterrence, which means a more violent and more punitive state often leads to more violence as the systems uh, compound in effect. We also find that small changes in conviction rates in sentencing practices or even the original crime rate can lay, lead to major differences in the system at the end of the day, like the cliched butterfly effect. This means that our old idea of punishment, there's a dial we could turn up or turn down as we wanted, uh, is not sufficient. We have to think of more complex ways of thinking about punishment. And this is where systems thinking and systems models come in place. They create a version of reality that help us to understand, to innovate, and to pick the important elements of a particular system to focus on. This can involve the creation of different models and testing each of these out until we find the ones that have the best elements. And recognising these elements we often have to do through pattern recognition, rather than necessarily thinking about the things that ought to be influential, or that we presume are influential. Here's an example of a simple model from Danella Meadows' work. The arrows represent the flow of resources through a system. The clouds at either end are inputs and outputs that, that exist outside the system, and the taps are regulators through which you can change the system. We'll look at what all these things mean in a moment, but this is just a simple example to get you started to thinking about the sorts of things that system thinkers do. Now this is a more complex example that includes feedback loops and flows that change the system itself. These models of course can be as complex as you like and include multiple subsystems, but they're tools to aid comprehension and if you make them too complex and they become too big to understand, then they don't serve their purpose. It's important to remember that the law traditionally does none of this. There's another video in this series on design thinking and the law, and legal systems are usually built with a particular intention and they're with particular enforcement mechanisms in mind, but not using any kind of design process. And often, existing systems are modified or added on to new regulatory systems. So there's no design process where different options are modelled, where there are prototypes and comparing. And again, there are arguments that due to the complex nature of today's society, this is something that law needs to do. And it's something that is happening increasingly that uh, regulators and law reformers are looking at designers and design thinking as an approach to legal change. And also, what we're talking about here, the idea of systems thinking as well. Now, most law degrees are not going to cover this sort of issue at all. Um, and certainly at CQU, we are ahead of the pack in this area. This is something that we are taking quite seriously. And particularly the criminology degrees have an extensive focus on that idea of systems thinking and using it to model practices in the criminal justice system. All right, so what are the important things that, that are included in systems? The foundation of the systems models are things called stocks and flows. Stocks are the resources that a system uses. Flows are the processes through which change occurs and the levels of the stocks go up and down. 
Now, these stocks can be physical resources or they can be money, but in the justice system, this is often time. We have a limited amount of court time, a set time amount of police time to devote to different issues, uh, a certain amount of time for policy change, and often the division of resources. We certainly do have issues about dividing monetary resources, but the actual allocation of time is something that's especially important for the justice system. Another thing to think about in terms of stocks is information. Information can be, can be a stock itself, and the way that information flows or often fails to flow within a system is something that can be modelled and understood. So when we look at stocks, most conventional systems and conventional ways of thinking do focus on stocks. And they do look at you know the number of the amount of money you have, the type of resources that you have. The difference for systems thinking is that it's dynamic and it's interested more in flows. How do these changes occur, and how do these changes occur as part of a system? And this is what makes this approach different. Another important concept is the idea of feedback loops, where flows are altered based on information from within the system itself. So we have a something like a thermostat, which will change the heat up and down depending on what the temperature in a room is. So we are interested in the way in which the um, uh, systems can change themselves and this can often happen in complex ways and different feedback systems can work together in ways that are unpredictable. So the, there are two types of feedback loop generally speaking. We have stabilizing loops that balance a system and reinforcing loops that drive further change, like compound interest, that the longer you leave it there, you get interest on interest on interest on interest. And when you have reinforcing loops, things can change very quickly as the uh, amount of effect, the amount of change compounds in on itself. So the more different competing regulatory systems and feedback loops you have in a system, the more complex it is to start with, but also the more unpredictable it becomes. And here's a quote from Danella Meadows, who's one of the uh, key thinkers in this area. She's talking about the unpredictability of systems, and she says, This perverse kind of result can be seen all the time. Someone is trying to fix a system and is attracted intuitively to a policy lever that in fact does have a strong effect on the system. And then the well-intentioned fixer pulls the lever in the wrong direction. This is just one example of how we can be surprised by the counterintuitive behaviour of systems when we try to change them. So there's a lot to systems thinking and definitely more than can be covered in a, in a short video like this. But this should give you a quick overview and an idea of what's involved. Now the approach of systems thinking is modularized, which allows you to model interaction of different systems and from subsystems within a system. It's very flexible. And this is again very important for the justice system where courts, policing and corrections each have their own systems and subsystems that interact with each other in complicated ways. It's important for law and justice areas of study generally because it involves moving beyond simple explanations. It means that some, that some of the wicked problems that we face we can understand in a more complicated way. And we can avoid simple predictive models like the one we talked about earlier when we talked about increasing punishment presuming to decrease rates of crime. And we know from the study of crime rates that this doesn't always occur. Now... I mentioned earlier that law has not yet adopted systems thinking in a, in a widespread way, but it is consistent with lots of elements of legal thought. When you think about the idea of rule of law, which is the idea of you know one single regulatory system that everyone uh, adheres to, the common law idea of precedent, the rational development of statute law in incremental ways, the idea of a system of rights that act as a regulatory system that sit on top of all other legal systems to govern what you do, you can see there's a lot of synergies here and there's a lot of potential for development in this area. So this is really a frontier area and it's an area where it's pretty exciting and we're really happy to be able to introduce you as students to this because we think it's going to be very important to you later on. And within law, there are certainly design parameters that we use when we're assessing systems, and these can be imported into systems thinking. So we look at elements like consistency, fairness, simplicity, flexibility, elegance, closure, justice. All these ideas really refer to the way that systems function. So there's a lot of work to be done in uh, mapping 
these ideas to, to systems and in being able to evaluate and understand our legal systems better, particularly how they interface with, you know, increasingly complicated social systems as well. So if you want to go further in this field, I've got a couple of recommendations for you. One is a book by Donella Meadows called Thinking in Systems, a Primer, that was published in 2008. This does a fantastic job at introducing you to systems thinking. It's a reasonably short book and it's a reasonably cheap book. So it's one I'd certainly recommend getting a copy for yourself and being able to refer back to it from time to time, particularly for those criminology students. The other thing I would also recommend is the Systems Innovation YouTube channel. And they certainly have some more complex in-depth videos on systems thinking, design thinking, and other ways of uh, other contemporary design models. Uh, these have very professional production, unlike my little homemade videos, and they have animation and all sorts of other things as well. So they're all reasonably short little snippets and uh, will introduce you to a lot of those key concepts in a lot more depth than I can do here. But ultimately, systems thinking is something that I think uh, you really need to have on your um, radar. And you have to, and it's something that at present, very few graduates in either law or criminology have the uh, skills or the background in, but that's going to change and it's going to change quite rapidly. So be ready for it.